This is on assignment. We've got another edition of On Assignment for you today. I am Alex Villarreal. And I'm Imran Siddiqui. We begin with the deadly attack at the Boston Marathon. We'll hear from a correspondent who knows the city well and find out what the bombings mean for other global cities. Violence rocks Venezuela after the late Hugo Chavez's successor wins the nation's presidential vote. We get perspective from our Latin America division. And later, a look at the twists and turns of North Korea's nuclear threats. And suddenly, Burma has an independent press, but will it last? Giving you the details the other shows leave out, this is On Assignment. Here in the United States, the deadly bombings of the Boston Marathon still top the news. And we're joined now by our national correspondent, Jim Malone, and reporter Henry Ridgewell in London. Let's start with you, Henry. If you can, take us back to 05 uh, when the London bombings happened, and if you can do a comparative analysis with regards to what happened in Boston, and how do you think the, the government is reassessing the security measures? Well, the bombings here in London in July 2005 were clearly a huge shock to the city authorities and to the people of the city themselves. And, and we've seen a similar response in Boston with the bombings there. A shock uh, initially, and then a level of resolve among the people that they're not going to let the terrorists or whoever carried out these attacks uh, win the day and they're going to get back to normal life as soon as possible. In terms of the response from the authorities and the security services, there were certain systemic failures that were reassessed following the attacks. They discovered, for example, that uh, their shortwave radios uh, did not work in the, in the tunnels uh, of the metro system here uh, and that held up the rescue effort. So there were certain things that were reassessed in terms of that, but there was also a, a re-evaluation really of, of the city's attitude towards attacks like these and a recognition perhaps that you can't lock down every single aspect of a city, every single transit system, every single street. Uh, a city by its own nature is vulnerable and, and a key part of, of keeping the security is the attitude of the public and the people around. So there is a, a, a raising of the level of awareness of the people in terms of looking out for suspect bags, suspect packages in vulnerable areas, in, in, in popular tourist areas, in, in transit systems and so on. Uh, and really um, the, the level of resolve in London came back uh, very strongly and, and people were determined to get back to normal. And I think uh, from what I've seen, we're beginning to see that in Boston as well. A lot of people uh, saying how tragic these events are, but also that, that the only way to respond to this really is to get back to life as normal. Jim, turning to Boston now, which is your hometown, the attacks coincided with the state holiday, the Patriots' mm -hmm. Day. How do you think the Bostonians are taking this? Well, obviously, it was a body blow to the city, its image. Uh, Bostonians are a resilient group. Uh, they're going to bounce back. Uh, sometimes they're a little hard to get to know, but once you get in their midst, uh, they become very loyal friends. And I think we saw in the immediate aftermath how people rushed to help those who were injured. You know, as a kid, we would go to the marathon every year. It was a big local holiday in Massachusetts. It drew runners from around the world and has for decades. Uh, the most elite marathon runners in the world like to participate in Boston. So it was a real day of the world coming into the Boston community. Uh, and although that's been rocked a bit by the events we've seen, uh, I think Boston will bounce back. It's also an indication that since 9-11, Americans may have become lulled into a false sense of security. The threats are still there, and I think this will be a reminder to that. Henry, tell me something. Uh, now in the digital age, when we have tons of video and images from cell phone and security cameras, how does, what kind of role do you think they play uh, in terms of uh, getting to the core of these investigations? In Britain, they play a hugely uh, important role. It's one of uh, the most uh, surveillance uh, uh, societies in the world. Uh, there's something like two million to four million surveillance cameras across the country in a, in a population of 60 million people. And there was a study done recently that suggested uh, on an average day, somebody would be filmed by a surveillance camera 300 times. And that was before the advent of, of camera phones and that sort of thing. In terms of the investigation into the July 2005 bombings, they played a key part because the surveillance cameras 
at railway stations that the bombers used to travel down to London picked up their faces very clearly. And so uh, very quickly following the bombings, the police were able to issue uh, photos of, uh, of these, uh, the people who had traveled down, the suspects, and, and very quickly able to investigate and check that there were no further threats and, and determine where this, this uh, attack had come from. So it does play a very important role here in Britain. And people are really used to the surveillance society okay. here now. There are portions of society who object to it, but I think uh, uh, the majority probably approve of it and, and see it as a way of keeping them safe. Uh, thank you to you, both of you for taking the time out. Thank you so much. Coming up, the dangerous tensions between North and South Korea. You're watching On Assignment. Tensions on the Korean Peninsula have been at the very high levels lately, with the North hinting that it has developed a nuclear warhead small enough to fit atop a missile. Most experts doubt that claim, but that hasn't stopped the country from threatening attacks on South Korea, Japan, and even the U.S. Now, North Korea's young leader Kim Jong-un has baffled observers with his aggressive nuclear posturing. I asked VOA reporter Steve Herman in Seoul if he has ever seen such severe tensions in the region. Here is what he told me. This is as high a tension level as we've seen on the Korean Peninsula, perhaps uh, since the armistice was signed in 1953. But what we should emphasize is it's been a war of words so far, a lot of posturing. Our nuclear strength is a reliable war deterrent and a guarantee to protect our sovereignty. The United States will do what is necessary to defend ourselves and defend our allies, Korea and Japan. But uh, there's nothing as severe that has happened so far uh, as occurred in 2010, when there was the sinking of a South Korean naval vessel and an artillery shelling on a South Korean frontier island uh, that killed uh, four people, including two civilians. Now, when you talk about the level of uh, rhetoric that we're hearing, especially coming from North Korea, what's the purpose of all of this? Well, one theory is the purpose is, is to cause panic here in South Korea, to uh, cause enough economic damage that this new, uh, what would seem to be an untested government of President Park Geun-hye would say, okay, we've got to stop this because uh, tourists are fleeing, hotels are losing money, the case on industrial complex is shut down, we have more than 100 small and medium-sized enterprises now that are fearing bankruptcy. None of those things have happened really except for the possible closure of the Kaesong industrial complex. But uh, there, there are some indications that if it continues at this severe of a level uh, for, for a longer period of time, then there could be actually some economic damage to the South Korean uh, people and, and a lot of businesses. And you, you, you yourself, you're actually in Seoul now, and you, that's where you're based um, as a correspondent for us. What's been the response among the people there? Pretty calm. Uh, there is no sign of uh, panic buying, as North Korea is alleging in one of its latest um, uh, broadcasts uh, from Pyongyang. Uh, the foreigners are not fleeing, again, another allegation that North Korea is making. One concern is we're approaching the Golden Week holidays at the end of the month for the Japanese, and uh, it could have some significant impact on that Golden Week holiday period. Now, Steve, in addition to uh, North Korea's threats against South Korea, its threats of an attack, it's also said that it's ready to launch a nuclear attack on the United States. How real is that threat? North Korea perhaps has a small number of nuclear weapons. It certainly has not miniaturized them to put them atop an intercontinental ballistic missile. And uh, there's no evidence that North Korea actually has an ICBM capable of reaching the mainland of the United States. The biggest threat here in Seoul there's more than a thousand pieces of long-range artillery pointed at this city. The metropolitan area has about 20 million people. But that threat has existed for many years, many decades, actually. What kind of role is China playing in all of this? Well, of course, without 
China, North Korea probably would have ceased to exist a long time ago. China has been. North Korea is only remaining a significant ally after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, what is the relationship right now? We're not exactly sure. There's been some statements coming out of Beijing that seem to express an unprecedented level of frustration, at least publicly, from the Chinese uh, in regards to the attitude of the North Korean government. And we can only imagine what's being said behind the scenes because China prefers to conduct its uh, tough diplomacy in, in that regard, especially with, uh, with other countries that it's been friendly to behind the scenes rather than coming out and openly criticizing them. But uh, China, of course, is, um, has, has been helpful recently in these uh, UN Security Council votes on sanctions, which, of course, has, has obviously angered North Korea. And that relationship may hold the key to a resolution of all of this. And in addition to China, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says Washington is willing to help negotiate a peaceful resolution of tensions. But in order for that to happen, the North must take steps toward abandoning nuclear weapons. We're taking a break now, but when we come back, a look at Venezuela's presidential election. You're watching On Assignment. And now to Venezuela, where Nicolas Maduro narrowly won the April 14th election to succeed President Hugo Chavez, who died of cancer last month. Now, Chavez handpicked Maduro to succeed him, and the new president has vowed to continue the socialist policies that Mr. Chavez put in place. Opposition candidate Enrique Capriles, on the other hand, favors more private market friendly policies. Joining us now, we have Alejandro Escalona of VOA's Spanish branch. Hello, Alejandro. Pleasure Welcome. to see you again. Pleasure to see you. So now, it's very interesting about this election that it was extremely close. I mean, what the, uh, what the election officials said, the final tally, very, very close percentages that we had. But starting out, Maduro was really very much in the lead. So what happened? What enabled Capriles to close that gap? I think that many, many voters, uh, what, what, what happened was that many voters migrated from uh, Nicolás Maduro towards um, Enrique Capriles. Maybe they thought there was not enough substance, uh, so to speak, in, in Nicolás Maduro's speeches, and that uh, was definitely a cause uh, for them to, um, a reason for them to migrate to, uh, to Enrique Capriles. And what does it say about now the strength of the opposition post-Chavez? Well, you know, the, the country is totally polar, polarized. 50% Chavistas, 50% opposition, but this is like a, a new Chavismo without Chavez. I guess time will tell. You know, what happened was that uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the campaign started just three weeks ago, but officially. But in truth, it started December 8th when uh, Hugo Chavez anointed Nicolás Maduro as his successor just before Chavez went to Cuba for his last um, uh, cancer surgery. Right, so, so it's been in the works. You know, it's, it, it's been crazy in a, in a way because the government, of course, has taken advantage of the recorded voice of President Hugo Chavez and his image to try to, uh, according to many analysts, according, uh, trying to manipulate this sentiment. Uh, about uh, Chavez, who, as you know, was a very charismatic leader. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned yeah. that um, manipulation of sentiment. There were a lot of people who felt that. You mentioned, you know, three-week campaign. Very, yeah. very tight Short amount lived. of time. Yeah. 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 So yeah. there were a lot of people who criticized that and who thought, you know, it seems like they're just trying to rush this election. Well, actually, you know, it, it was done by the book, the, the, the blue book, the Constitution, that is. It's, uh, uh, the Constitution establishes that elections had to be called in 30 days after a situation like this and so that's okay. what they so did. So that wasn't an unusual situation? No, no. Well, it was unusual in the sense that it's uh, but basically the first time something like that happens in, in the history of Venezuela of, of, of democracy so uh, that's, uh, that was done according to the constitution. It's something very new. Right. Uh, nothing like this had happened before in Venezuela. Now being Venezuelan yourself you can oh, yes, obviously <laughs> offer us a very unique perspective mm -hmm. on the country. You lived there, you've seen the political process mm -hmm. firsthand. What can you tell us, uh, people who have not had the opportunity to go visit Venezuela, what can you tell us, what insight can you give us in terms of how the election process works and the level of volatility really in the country politically? 
Well, this is a uh, situation right now is totally divided, very polarized. Uh, people are going through a very complicated phase or stage of, uh, you know, demonstrations, riots, violence. The government is trying to exert a lot of pressure on this on these uh, students' movements and the, the general population who have uh, been very open and, and they're not really afraid anymore to, to raise their voice against what they believe it's uh, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, s some repression against uh, democracy movements. So, right. um, so I certainly way, hope that uh, things will, you know, change eventually for the better and that both sides of the, of the problem will understand that uh, Maduro has to understand eventually that half of the country doesn't like him. So he's going to have to come to terms with that. Right. All right. Well, we know you'll be following this closely for us, <laughs> and we will definitely have you on again. Alejandro Escalona from VOA's Spanish branch. We move next to Burma, which has seen tremendous changes the past two years, including in media. When 16 Burmese newspapers were granted operating licenses on April 1st, they became the first private print dailies allowed to publish in Burma in nearly 50 years. But the milestone comes amid an outcry over Burma's newly released draft media law, which critics say could roll back government promises to loosen its grip on the long, tightly controlled industry. Viewers Mark Snowis has been following this, and we asked him to tell us more. Let's check it out. State-run media controlled the dissemination of hard news, and independent journalists were heavily censored. Many were spied upon, imprisoned, even tortured. The only objective news coverage available was produced by the country's exile media and foreign broadcasters such as The Voice of America, BBC, and Radio Free Asia. Tell us a little bit about the life of a journalist in Burma. What are their challenges? Well, the life of a Burmese journalist um, is changing as we speak, basically. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, the uh, military dictatorship uh, basically dissolved itself. Uh, last year, in August, they abolished um, censorship. Um, print daily, private daily newspapers that had been banned for 50 years, um, as of August, or as of uh, April 1st of this year, were allowed to publish. Um, they didn't have dailies because uh, daily newspapers took too much time to censor. They only had weeklies before. Okay, uh, some of the critics uh, and, and people, people in your piece also mentioned this, that first they say that uh, we have, we, we will allow these dailies to work and then they come up with this draft law which is going against what they promised. What's, what's exactly going on? Well, it's hard to throw off old habits, I think. And um, uh, there was such strong censorship for so long in Burma um, that the government now came up with this draft media law, which is supposed to enshrine a lot of the new freedoms that, that, they, that they say they want, you know, and they want to build a democracy. Um, but the law actually, a lot of outside critics say that it has just, it's just as repressive as, as the previous 1962 law that it's supposed to um, supersede. Just like they made this law and they said, no, this law might not work, so let's take it back. But then there was a push, so they're saying that we might just go ahead with that. Part of what is complicated is that, for example, the law bans any reporting on the government's battles with ethnic rebels. It also bans any critical coverage of the military drafted constitution. Now, if you look at the first of those two issues, you know, there's fighting going on in the north with Kachin rebels, there's fighting going on in the southwest um, with the Rohingya. Um, these are minority groups that have deep conflicts with the Buddhist majority, and then you have this new media, some of which is sensationalist, which is playing up and fanning the, the, the flames of some of these hatreds, some, some people's um, sort of everyday opinions about these ethnic conflicts are getting splashed across the media and the government is saying, wait, stop, don't, don't publish that. And they're kind of going back into a knee-jerk reaction to, well, we can just, we can just solve this problem by, by censoring everything. How do the exile media fit into the scenario, the Burmese exile media? Right, you had different layers of, of, of foreign, of foreign uh, or, and or exile media for the 50 years of the dictatorship. And, and as far as the Burmese uh, exile media go, 
The democratic voice of Burma was, was based in Oslo uh, for years. Uh, you had Thailand-based and Indian-based, India-based exile groups that were really the, um, the main source of information for people who managed to get a hold of that. It was not easy, but they could. Um, those groups now want to come back. There are many challenges in Burma, but as far as this draft law is concerned, how does it affect international broadcasters? International broadcasting, um, I actually can't really comment on that, but in general, broadcast media is m more heavily restricted. Um, the internet is still also quite restricted, even though there's, you know, more people are coming online and there are projections that by 2015, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of more people will be connected online. And, but bloggers are, are, are working in Burma, but there, there's this nebulous, ambiguous situation with certain laws on the books that are still there. All right, and our thanks to Mark Snowis for that. Of course, we know Mark will continue to follow Burmese media developments closely. And you, the viewers, can always get the latest at voanews.com. Speaking of watching developments closely, Americans are not the only ones interested in the upcoming U.S. Supreme Court ruling on same-sex marriage. Activists in India are paying close attention to the debate as well. A key court ruling decriminalized gay sex in India about four years ago, but that ruling is under a challenge. VOA's Arup Pandey has more. As a gay man in India, life has not been easy for Kiran. He left his home in the Andaman Islands and came to New Delhi two years ago, after years of ridicule from teachers, students and members of his own family. The discrimination and feeling of being an outcast was not limited to his personal life. When my employer found out that I am homosexual, they fired me from my job, saying you look and act gay and we can't keep you here. Kiran found work hope and support at the NAS Foundation, a non-governmental organization working with people who have HIV and AIDS. Anjali Gopalan founded the group in 1994 to work with men whom she says had no gay identity and were getting married to women to conform to societal norms. To me it became very clear the impact on the lives of women and children. So it really, it, it, it took on a great urgency. It was to ensure that people I believe that people who don't value themselves will not protect themselves from HIV. She decided to focus her efforts on repealing the law criminalizing homosexual sex after speaking with a 20-year-old who underwent shock therapy at a major Delhi hospital in order to, quote, become straight. The nearly decade-long effort paid off with the Delhi High Court declaring the law unconstitutional in 2009. Gopalan says the ruling has tremendous impact. No longer could we, as a culture, sweep homosexuality under the carpet by saying, oh, it's a Western phenomenon. Lawyer and gay rights activist Aditya Bandapadhyay agrees. He says the ruling means police are less likely to harass gay men in public parks, but more importantly, that homosexuals are less afraid of coming out. What has happened since the judgment is that this enormous exuberant force of people have been unleashed. You know, it's like the genie getting out of the bottle and cannot be put back again. People have certainly tasted that liberty. Still, gay rights activists say the fight is far from over. Conservative groups are challenging the ruling that decriminalized homosexual sex in the Indian Supreme Court. Until that issue is settled, activists say they cannot press for same-sex marriage and other rights. Arup Pandey, VOA News, New Delhi. All right, our thanks to Aru Pandey for that. Aru arrived in New Delhi recently, and she's already hit the ground running for us. Thanks again to Aru. And that's the end of our show. Tune in next week when we look at the grave dangers facing women in post-revolutionary Egypt. We'll also go to Senegal to see the extremes to which some women go for beauty. Be sure to check us out on assignment on the internet. We're at voanews.com, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you next time.